Good morning, boys and girls. Um, I hope you're having a good day, a great week. Um, I'm just coming off the Easter weekend. And so um, for those fourth graders, last week, if you were able to watch the YouTube of um, the Boston Molasses Flood, it is a companion piece to another um, man-made disaster that we are going to read about this week. Um, and this week, uh, the story is about the Great Peshtigo Fires. Um, a lot of you probably like me and have never heard about this before, but this particular fire um, ended up being one of the most deadliest fires in our country. Um, as you get older and start reading in history, you'll start um, reading some things about um, the Great Chicago Fire, um, which happened right around the same time as this fire. Um, and the reason that it is more famous is clearly because the town of, or the city of Chicago was a lot bigger and a lot more well-known than the small town of Peshtigo. This story also is written by Lauren Tarshis, who is the author of the I Survived um, series. You can also Google um, this particular story. Now, the story is not called the Peshtigo Fire. It's about the Peshtigo Fire, but it is actually called um, the Blood Red Night. And if you want to Google this, you can pull up um, a PDF of the actual story and you can follow along with me if you want to pause and, and print out the story and follow along with me or just listen to this story as we're reading. The skill that we talked about when we last read The Boston Molasses Flood was cause and effect. And that is the same skill that we're going to be listening for and talking about as we read this story as well. Because as we get into the story, you will discover there are a lot of causes to this disaster. And there were a lot of very sad uh, effects afterwards. Now, some of these causes were man-made causes, um, but some of these causes of the fire ended up being natural as well. And in fourth grade, we talk about direct causes and indirect causes. A direct cause is one you can look at it and know for a fact it led straight to this effect. An indirect cause might be something that happened a little while prior to the effect, but eventually it led to or helped contribute to the effect. And I'll show you an example um, in the stories we read. Um, this was published in 2014. So it's, um, even though the story happened a long time ago, and one cool fact about this story is um, Peshtigo is a small town that was in Washington, I'm sorry, Wisconsin, I saw the W, um, in Wisconsin, and it is also the same area, if any of you ever read the Laura Ingalls Wilder stories, the Little House on the Prairie stories, Laura Ingalls Wilder um, actually has a connection. She was born, actually born in a cabin near um, Peshtigo. If you've read some of her stories, there's one called The Great Woods or The Big Woods, and, and in it, she's talking about these just miles and miles of forest of trees. Well, this is the same forest that we're talking about in this story, okay? So we're gonna read this story. I hope you'll listen, and, and there's also some great YouTubes out there um, that if you uh, your parents help you guide through uh, YouTube's about the Peshtigo fire. Um, you can see some some pictures and some things like that. And again, it happened quite a long time ago. Um, so the pictures are really kind of rough, but there's still some things on there. There's some videos that you can watch about the historical event. So let's go ahead and get into the story. It is called The Blood Red Night by Lauren Tarshis. By the end of the night, the town of Peshtigo, Wisconsin, would be burned to ashes. As many as 2,500 people would be dead. But on that Sunday morning on October the 8th, 1871, seven-year-old John Kramer could not have imagined that he was about to come face-to-face -face 
with the deadliest fire in American history. So that's just kind of the set up the, the story for you. It had been a difficult but exciting year for the Kramer family. John, his parents, Joseph and Catherine, and his nine-year-old brother, Mike. The Kramers had come to the United States from Germany in the 1860s, settling first in the rolling farmland of upstate New York and then in 1870, heading west to the young state of Wisconsin. Thousands of new immigrants had made the same westward journey in the 1860s, lured by the promise of cheap farmland and the chance to carve a brand new life out of the fresh American wilderness. And what a wilderness it was. This reminds me also when we talked about the molasses flood, we had a situation where we had a big immigrant population in the north part of Boston. And that story happened in 1919. This story is happening in 1871. So about 50 years prior to the Boston molasses flood. Um, in fourth grade in social studies, we studied a lot about the Louisiana Purchase, Lewis and Clark going to explore the West, and then the big westward expansion where everybody was lured west by the promise of all this free land and then later gold in California and we study all the different trails that were heading west. This story is a connection to part of that because you see that these immigrants that have come from different parts of the world to North America are brought there with this great promise of all of this wonderful land, farmland, and a, just a chance to start a brand new exciting life in the wilderness. In the 1860s, an enormous forest stretched across Wisconsin and neighboring states, billions and billions of trees covering thousands of square miles of land. These were the forest of fairy tales full of towering trees, howling wolves, and dagger-clawed bears. Now we know from studying fairy tales, if you've been working with Miss um, Nunnery and Writer's Workshop and writing fairy tales, what those are. And this is a great piece of figurative language because even though we know they're not fairy tales there, we often talk about these great forests in a fairy tale. And I love how Laura and the author brought that to life in this statement of saying, these are the forest of fairy tales, full of towering trees and howling wolves and dagger-clawed bears. What vivid adjectives she used instead of just saying, no, they were full of trees and wolves and bears. So in your writing, think about how this author is making a great picture for us and seeing all these great trees and the animals that live there. Laura Ingalls Wilder, author of the Little House series, was born in a cabin in the northern woods of Wisconsin just three years before the Kramers arrived in the area. Describing the land where her family lived, this is what she says. The great dark trees of the big woods stood all around the house and beyond them were other trees and beyond them were more trees as far as a man could go to the north in the day or in a week or in a whole month. There was nothing but woods. And that's hard for us that live in a city or in the suburb, suburbs to know what that's like. We've never seen great big woods where you could just walk and walk and walk for days and months and still be in woods. But Lauren, Laura Ingalls Wilder does a great job of describing that in her books, if you've ever read any of those. And Laura was not exaggerating. The forest that stretched across northern Wisconsin was truly exceptional. For centuries, these woods were mostly undisturbed by humans. The only sounds were those of nature, the chirp of birds, the growls of wild animals, and the soft whisper of leaves rustling in the wind. And again, what beautiful 
language, specific language she's using in her writing. By the time John and his family arrived, big changes were happening in Wisconsin's woods. Chop, chop, chop. In the late 19th century, American cities were booming, especially Chicago, which was 250 miles south of Peshtigo. Just 40 years earlier, Chicago had been little more than a small town on a mosquito-ridden marsh. But by 1871, it was the fastest growing city in the world. Every day, it seemed new buildings rose up, mansions and shops and warehouses and department stores. And for all of this construction, Chicago builders needed a constant supply of woods. And where would you guess they would find this wood? In the great forest of northern Wisconsin. In the 1860s, lumber companies began buying up huge chunks of the northern woods. They sent out armies of lumberjacks to chop down trees, which were then stripped of the branches, dragged by ox cart across the forest, and dumped into the Peshtigo River. The river's rushing water carried the giant logs downstream to Peshtigo Sawmill, where they were then transformed into wood for building. Now, I love how she used almost like a little how-to in this section of her story. She literally gave you all of the descriptions of how we get wood. And still today, this is a lot of the practice in the lumbering industry. The lumber companies will buy up big sections of land with the wood. They will chop down the trees and then they'll strip all the bark and limbs off of that. Because usually they only want that primary main part of the tree. And then they'll usually do this near a river because the river is a great way to get the wood from one place to the other. So they would put the trees um, into the river, the Peshtigo River, and then the water would carry the logs downstream to the sawmill. And a sawmill is a place where the woods are then either turned into lumber planks for building in all different sizes. If you go into Home Depot or Lowe's, you'll see wood in every shape and size. And sometimes the wood is also chopped up because guess what? Wood is used also um, to make paper. And so there's all kinds of things a sawmill would do to that big tree to get it into different sizes and shapes for use. By the 1870s, the forest surrounding Peshtigo echoed with the curses and shouts of lumberjack, the chop, chop, chop of axes, and the thunder of the 150 foot tall trees crashing to the ground. After an area of forest had been stripped of the trees, lumber companies were happy to sell the land to farmers like John's parents. So they pretty much stripped all the trees off this land and then they would sell the land back to people who wanted to come and farm it because now it's free of the trees. The Kramers felt at home where they met in Wisconsin where they met many of their fellow German immigrants. Within a year of their arrival, they had finished building their house. The boys were thriving and everything seemed hopeful. And then came the fire, a choking fog. Soon after moving to Wisconsin, the Kramers had learned that fires were a fact of life in the northern woods. Though some fires were sparked by lightning, most were set intentionally. That means on purpose. Lumberjacks lit fires to consume the branches that they had hacked off the trees. Farmers used the fire to clear the land of the tree stumps and the brush that the lumberjacks had left behind. At times, there were so many fires burning that a choking fog of smoke hung over Peshtigo. So these were fires set purposefully. They needed to burn what was not used of the trees, and the farmers, in order to have farm land, would have to dig up those stumps or burn them out so that they would be um, out of the ground. So they were setting these on purpose, even though you heard the author say Sometimes there were accidental fires set by nature from lightning. So at this particular time, there's a lot of fires going on. So now you're seeing some causes, all right? So we know there's gonna be this devastating fire. 
So let me just pause real briefly to talk to you about a direct cause and an indirect cause. All right, so a direct cause might be we know that at this particular time in the story, there are a lot of fires being set to burn off all of the excess, the stumps and the branches. That could be a direct cause of the fire starting. We haven't read that yet. But why was all of this wood being chopped down? So what did I mention earlier in the story? There was a great need for wood. Right, so think about, we talked about the city of Chicago growing by leaps and bounds. And in order to build the buildings and the shops and the mansions and the homes, they needed a lot of wood. And this wood came from Peshtigo. We would call that an indirect cause. Because the city of Chicago was growing and needed all this wood, they would go to Peshtigo and get the wood. So they were logging all of this wood out of Peshtigo. So then that was creating the need to burn all of the excess. So that, though needing the wood in Chicago didn't make the fire happen, it indirectly caused the need for these fires to be set. All right, let's keep moving with our story. The early fall of 1871 had been a particularly bad time for fires. Little rain had fallen during the summer and the entire Midwest was parched. Creeks had dried up, trees had withered, and on September 24th, a series of fires began to burn out of control in and around Peshtigo. The blazes burned hundreds of acres of forest land and incinerated homes and shops in nearby communities. Incinerated means just burned it quickly with a really high heat. When Peshtigo's biggest factory caught fire, hundreds of men rushed to fight the flames with buckets of water from the river. They managed to save the building, but dozens were injured in the exhausting fight. That fire cast a spell of fear over Peshtigo. A few people were so rattled that they packed up and left the area for good. But most families lacked the money to start again someplace new. All they could do was try to prepare. A town priest, Father Peter Pernan, buried, buried the church's precious bowls and goblets in the ground. Farmers kept wet blankets in their barns to protect their animals from airborne sparks. The Kramers cleared their land of every speck of dried brush and wood. But in fact, there was no way to prepare for the horrors to come. A blood red sky. October 8th dawned unnaturally hot. So do you see more and more causes happening? It was an unusually dry time of year. It was a really hot day. There was dry brush and, and trees all around. So you see all these causes lining up. The sky glowed orange from the many small fires smoldering in the forest. John's parents could see flames lapping at the edge of the woods around their house. They sensed disaster was coming soon. They were determined to save their home, but they wanted their sons out of the fire's reach. On the neighbor's farm was a 40-acre field, freshly plowed and free of combustible trees and brush. Mrs. Kramer gave the boys strict instructions to go to the middle of the field and wait there until she or their father, father fetched them. Doom must have filled John's heart as he and Mike headed to the field. Would they ever see their parents again? So this was probably the safest place the parents could think to send John and his brother. 40 acres is a big area and it's freshly plowed, which means there's no trees or branches on it. And it's just dirt, fresh dirt that's been turned over. So as we know, fire won't really burn dirt. So if they're in the middle of this big land of soil, they hopefully will be safe. So they are putting their sons first, trying to keep them safe while they go back to try to save their house. As the day wore on, the smoke thickened and the sky turned blood red. Strong winds swept into the region. So wind is another factor, another cause. Many hoped that a soaking rainstorm was on the way and the risk of the fire would pass. 
but there would be no rain that night, only violent, swirling gusts of wind that whipped up the small fires in the forest. These fires grew bigger and bigger until finally they joined together into one monstrous inferno. Flames towered hundreds of feet into the sky. Trees exploded in the extreme heat. Flaming hunks of wood flew across the forest, setting more fires miles away. Around 10 p.m., the people of Peshtigo heard an ear-splitting roar, which Father Pernin compared to the sound of a speeding freight train. In fact, it was the sound of the fire, a blaze of extraordinary size, power, and heat erupting out of the forest. The fire was now a firestorm, a rare type of fire that occurs when strong winds combine with large amounts of flammable material like trees to feed the flames. The fire was, oh, I just read that, sorry. Firestorms burn far hotter than regular fire fi wildfires and create their own swirling winds and explosive gases. So this is no ordinary fire, it's a fire storm. That's where you have the fire coming and then these huge kind of gust of winds. So it's almost like a tornado made of fire. I mean, it's really dangerous and destructive. For most people nearby, the sound of the fire blasting out of the forest was the last thing they would ever hear. Sheets of flames. John's parents fled their home moments before the explosion. They knew their house would be destroyed. Now they just wanted to find their boys. They left with only one possession, a mattress stuffed with feathers, and they started toward the plowed fields to find their boys. They soon realized they would never make it. Flames were everywhere, closing in on the Kramers from all directions. It was as though the air itself were ablaze. All seemed hopeless for John's parents until they noticed a well. They shoved their mattress into the water, soaking it, and then climbed into the well and pulled the mattress on top of themselves. As the Kramers hid inside the well, clinging to each other in terror, they could not begin to imagine the scene of horror unfolding in Peshtigo. The heat and the flames killed hundreds of people instantly. Others died attempting to flee to the river. The Kramers could hear the fire roaring above them and they did not expect to survive the night. Neither did John and Mike who huddled together in the middle of the plowed field. The fire raged for hours. It leveled Peshtigo and 16 other towns to the north. By morning, more than a billion trees were gone and an area twice the size of Rhode Island was nothing more than a sea of charred trees and ash. Nobody knows how many people died though many agree it was likely between 1,000 and 2,500. Miraculously, the entire Kramer family survived. John and Mike staggered out of the field. Joseph and Catherine climbed out of the well, shivering but unhurt. As John would say decades later, the joy of their reunion carried the family through the difficult months that followed. Their town was gone, as were most of their friends. The Kramers decided to stay and help rebuild. John was still living there when he died at the age of 81, surrounded by his six children and four grandchildren. History has largely forgotten the great Peshtigo fire, but John's grandchildren will always know that their lucky grandfather survived the most deadly fire in U.S. history. And it's really kind of sad that there's not an exact number of people um, who died because for one reason, um, all the records were burned. So in a town that was just starting, you know, you would have records of, of when people were born and when people died, when people got married, when people got baptized, all kinds of important information, but all of those records were burned. And then also, um, so many people were killed there, there was no one to be a witness to who all was killed. There were so few that survived that 
you know, there was just no real way. And with the extreme nature of the fire, there just really weren't a lot of clues left behind. So anyway, you can Google some information in YouTube to get some more details about the fire and think about how this relates to the Boston Molasses Flood. How each of these, there were many man-made causes to them and how could this have been prevented? Be thinking about ways that these um, disasters could have been prevented. Um, thanks for being with me as we read this story today. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day.